Thank you, Rahul, for firstly organizing this Turnip Innovation Fest. Uh, and this is a great, uh, you know, I guess discussion that we had from Manish just a bit earlier. So again, Manish, knowing him, uh, always, you know, provides something which is worth thinking about. And and again, uh, you know, thank you all. Great to see so many of you join here uh, this morning. So today, I'm going to talk about how to select research projects for tech transfer and commercialization, right? So your uh, the goal is is to sort of inspire you with a few things that allow you to consider. You may be focused on a few projects, and but which ones do you take further ahead? Uh, from the view of of not just doing research or fundamental research for the sake of publishing, but if you want to take that research work and convert that into products, if you want to work with the industry and try to see if they can absorb your work, how should you think about selecting these projects in the first place? And why does this selection matter? Because I believe that a problem well-defined is already half solved. Meaning if you chose the right problem, then, you know, the solution, like the choosing the right problem problem is 50% of, of the solution, right? So whatever outcome that you need afterwards, all that has a better chance of succeeding, particularly from a commercialization sense. So let us dive in. The framework I'm going to share with you is based on this concept called as three design challenges. Now, I apply these three design challenges to select something, you know, that you would call as an innovation, you know, uh, or the identification of an innovative product, right? What will constitute something that will give you a wow experience to someone? So this discussion today is going to be based on these three design challenges, but adapted for, you know, choosing a research project. And this framework, in some sense, is quite simple. There are three primary criteria you need to look at. And I call that criteria as people, technical, and business. And strictly in that order. So first, we'll, we'll look at the people segment. Then we'll understand what the technical segment focuses on. And then we'll determine if there is any business potential. Only if you meet those three challenges should you embark further on that journey. The people segment tries to look if we are addressing a real customer need. Okay, now a customer here is very different for a research project and it's very different for uh, for a real world product. So if, if I have a pen in my hand and I'm, I'm trying to introduce that new product, I need to know that who are my customers because there are already so many pens out in the market. Right? But I might be looking at a very funky pen. Maybe it's a digital pen. Maybe it's a pen which can uh, write on our phones, on our tablets, and it can also write well on actual books and paper. Now, it is my duty to understand, firstly, whether uh, the people want that product or not. Right. So how do I go about that? And for most uh, projects which are uh, around, you know, or most product development focuses on understanding the users, right? You want to talk to them. You want to understand what their world is like. You want to understand what are the big pain points that they are trying to solve. So you're trying to get a bank of information around what problems people are facing. You're also compiling what is the size of this population? Is it one person? Is it uh, just teenagers? Is it uh, is it just uh, people in certain geographical locations and so on? But for a research project, we need to ask the same questions a bit differently. The first step out here, like I'm sure all of you do, is to conduct literature search. But I suggest you do this in phases. And the phases I recommend are low, medium and uh, heavy or high. So in low, what I'm trying to uh, convey is that you focus on some cursory uh, literature search process. Like try to read white papers. Uh, white papers give you information which are a bit broader. They're not as detailed as a journal paper. And you don't need that kind of rigor at this particular stage. You're trying to read industry reports here in the low phase. 
so the intention here is that you are trying to get some sense of the status in that particular domain. Once you are a bit satisfied, you know that hey, there is some potential here, which I, or there is some uh, opportunity for me to explore further. Then you dive a bit deeper, and that's when you maybe start uh, reading. You know, I would say journal papers, but I would call them as review papers. Review papers are, are of course, a lot more detailed compared to white papers, but they they have uh, an understanding or they provide you an understanding of what that overall research landscape covers. Right. So you you first confirm your analysis over there that hey, your white papers give you some idea on here is something for me to go after. You confirm that a bit in the in the medium phase. And then once you are really, really sure that, hey, I think I'm on to something, that's when you dive further deeper. And this is when you actually start, you know, diving into, into individual research papers. And that direction for that comes from the review papers. Because the review paper gave you information in a bit wider scape, a wider landscape. And then from that, you are cherry picking in uh, kind of uh, in which direction to go further. The analogy I'll give you is that like, if you were to drill an oil well today, what would you do? So in the, in the low phase, which is, you know, you're trying to familiarize yourself with the industry. You're trying to look at satellite information. You're trying to look at, at say geographical maps and all that. And then you start narrowing down. Maybe you, you try to understand what the grounds, uh, you know, status is. Maybe you hone in on a country or a, a specific state, maybe even a specific district. And then where exactly to drill into, right? So that's your that's your heavy or, or high literature search phase. Now, in all these phases, what you're trying to do is the step number two, which is you are trying to record unanswered questions. So any point of time you you see that something is not explained, you know, to your satisfaction. And there are times when people say, we are observing this phenomena. We don't fully understand it. So you're trying to record such observations so because these are, are the areas to drill further into. These are the questions worth answering. But are they really worth answering? That's the phase where you try to determine how critical these are to the scientific community. Because your primary goal for research is to advance the science. The commercialization is the next step. But at least let's take care of the primary first. Now, the, the problems which are critical to the scientific community, it's ultra important to highlight them. And those are the ones that will lead to, for example, it can be a PhD research topic or it can be an M-Tech topic. Right? So after you've done that, you confirm with the industry acquaintances whether the industry also cares for these unanswered questions? Does the industry see potential? So if, if you were to solve those questions or if you were to give them this next level of understanding or this next level of process that you've developed, this next algorithm that you develop, can the industry use that or not? Okay, so I'll just recap here. So in the people segment for our research project identification, we are going to convert, we're we are going to conduct our literature search in phases, low, medium, and high. From that, we'll record unanswered questions or unexplained observations. Basically, we're trying to find something which is worth probing further. Now, before we actually probe them, we are going to determine how critical those questions, those observations are to the scientific community. Separately, we'll also confirm with our industry colleagues, with the people that we want to do tech transfer to. We're going to confirm if, if they will benefit from these unanswered questions or unobserved uh, or unexplained observations. So Balagopi asked, finding the right customer, uh, is it we converse? So I'm not sure if I follow your question, but the customer in this case for a research project, primary customer is your scientific community. Are they other researchers? And your your I guess another secondary customer is your industry, right? Are your, uh, those industry colleagues need to know whether they can absorb your work and go further with it. 
Vidyesh asked whether we need to check for the problems of people for doing research. Yes, Vidyesh, uh, we, we do that. And instead of talking to individual people, what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, determine that in the literature search phases. So any journal papers, so, so in the low phase, you're starting from white papers. And white papers are generally written by industry experts. We try to look at, uh, at industry journal research reports. If they are publishing something, that is an indirect proof that people are interested in that particular research area. Next, when you go to the, the medium phase, you look at, at, uh, at what, you, what I would call as an industry research report or a research review paper. That tells you whether the research community cares for that topic also or not. Right? And then by the time you, you reach the next phase, you are very sure of diving further. Next question I'll focus on is by Selva Kumar, that what do we have to do in the determined section? So in the, determine, in the determination phase, what you're trying to do is the unanswered questions which you spotted from your journey, the opportunities which you spotted. You try to talk to your colleagues in the scientific community. So this, what I would do is I would talk to the professors. I would ask them that I could, I could solve these, let's say, three questions. Which ones should I solve further? And collect the observations from the professor. Similarly, if you have access to, you know, in those uh, journal papers, you would have seen the authors. Try to have conversations with those authors because quite likely they might be working on that anyway. But it's, it's just good to uh, have an understanding from them. If possible, attend conferences. Like there are uh, industry society chapters, there are uh, engineering chapters, for example. If you can find the local meetings, you, you try to attend those and talk to the scientists, talk to the engineers, talk to the researchers in those communities. Discuss what your ideas are with them. And there, the minute that they tell you, you know what, that's an interesting problem. That is something worth solving. That's when you know you're on the right track. Uh, I'll focus on Darbha's question, which is the message, which is we identify market research and integrate with other literature search methods and do a customer survey before starting a good translatable project. So Darbha, what we are doing here is we'll start with the market research, which is in the low phase. So hopefully white papers uh, will also convey that same information. We will integrate with the other traditional liter literature search methods, which is the medium and the heavy phases. The customer survey here may not be fully required because a customer survey for me is when I'm launching a finished product into the market. But here, the question we are trying to solve is whether a research project is worth undertaking or not. Right? So I won't necessarily do a customer survey right now. I'll do that afterwards. Okay, and Mrs. Didi Dokate asked, can we follow review papers as literature, literature for our research? Yes, that is in the medium phase. Okay, so I'm going to take more questions later on, but let's move on to the next section, which is the technical section. So to recap, what we did in the people segment is we determined if something was worth addressing further or not. Now we... Uh, meaning we, we haven't actually solved anything. We have just identified whether a question is worth answering. Right? You've, ident you've identified a problem statement. The solution part comes now. And that's what we'll do in the technical segment. That when you solve it, right, assuming that you do, is your solution going to be better than what exists today? So if you're going to be exploring, let's say a new experimental method, for a process, what do you expect as the outcome? Will that method give you much better performance than the approaches being followed today? Can you result uh, in, in, a, in a finished output that is, for example, stronger than what is there today? If you're going to be working, let's say, on an algorithm, is that algorithm going to give you a better accuracy? Is it going to solve the problem in lesser time? So you're trying to identify which metrics are the key ones that you will improve on. But there are more nuances to it. But what are those? Now, quite likely in the people segment, 
you converge on an area that this area is worth solving. Now, instead of solving area wise, so in the technical segment, you're actually going to start drilling the hole to ultimately land oil, right? So you have to focus on one point. Where are, going to, where are you going to probe? So you have to pick one key problem to address. Okay, so from whatever observations you are, you have to narrow down on, this is the key problem that I will address. And that problem has been validated by your, uh, your scientific colleagues, by your industry colleagues. Next, you plan the solution in phases. Again, we'll plan this in low, medium, and high. We start with low. And here the idea first is that instead of actually getting things together to solve it, we'll try to whiteboard it. We'll try to go with a block diagram. Can I even set up a set up a pen and paper solution in the first place? Meaning not in reality, can I just determine the broad steps which are required to solve? So I, I get I get a landscape to to go after, and then I'll I'll dive a bit deeper into those, which is how do I get the different building blocks for that? Um, do I need to order some things? Do I need to uh, need to have access to certain facilities to solve it and so on? And then the final step is the high phase, I call it, is the actual nitty gritties, right? You might be coding in some cases. You might be running experiments in a lab in some cases and so on. In the determined uh, state over here, you will try to understand what is the performance impact. You'll focus on the metrics that could be, uh, you know, what are the output that you will generate? It could be metrics based on that, or it could be a metrics of the process itself that are you going to converge in a much faster state are you going to take uh, lesser resources to do it are you going to optimize the performance right are you going to result in a solution which is scalable right so you will determine the the performance impact but alongside that it's also important to know that ultimately people or different technologies will be required to enable that in the first place so what is the skill level required can i do it and if if you cannot do it, can your can your team members do it? What kind of uh, education background will they need? And if they don't have those skills, can they be taught to them? Will you need to arrange for some master classes from either the research or the scientific community? Will you need them to go through some training in a dedicated lab? Right. So try to understand what is the the skill development that you need to do before you embark on that journey. And of course, the equipment which is required, the kind of facilities which you need to enable those solutions. And the selection for that is always going to be based on the one that is going to give you a significant technical advantage. And again, the what is significant? You have to look at uh, both the scientific community for your core research project and to the industry if you're thinking from a tech transfer perspective. So to the industry, you may want to ask that what kind of a performance benefit will you look in uh, before you consider this thing? Because what happens is, is a, uh, and this is where even I was naive as a graduate student, that we would focus on a new way of, of doing things. And this was in the polymer industry. And we're like, hey, here's a new process that we've come up with. But that process was not easily transferable to the industry. Because the industry was set using certain equipment, the industry was also using, you know, certain tools, and so they would have to change things significantly before they could adopt our approach. And so that amount of change was not uh, fully digestible for them. So although our research approach did have significant advantages from a scientific perspective, but for the industry it was not, uh, you know, fully ready. So that, that selection becomes critical. The last segment, and this is where I would say you need a lot more contribution from your uh, industry colleagues, is the business aspect. That is there a viable business model that you, know, you can generate with your approach? Now, what are the steps that you follow you know, to understand this thing? So work with your industry colleagues. And if you don't have a ready industry partner right now, maybe find a friend who is, let's say, from the College of Business or someone who, who has done an MBA or, or a 
or someone maybe ideally who is in the, who is in the tech transfer domain you want to bring this person into into the mix you know and get the next level of understanding and what is this understanding that what is required to absorb that technology so if the industry were to take it so in the example i gave you that we have a polymer process and now i want to explore that with the the plastics industry what overhaul do they need to do at their end can they absorb it right away does it fit with the existing machinery that they have do they need to invest in some new equipment before they absorb it will they need to change basically a lot of things at their end or will it be readily absorbable something which is ready to absorb is of course preferred now assuming that they have adopted this approach which which i have been discussing with them how much time will it take for them you know before they start seeing results will they have to stop their existing processes or can it run in in parallel and if their operations are stopped how much time before you know they start seeing the results but very likely something which uh, runs just for one time it's very unlikely that it will be perfect you know you will have to iterate you will have to optimize it you will look at the finished product and then you might say that no it it needs further improvement it's not fully ready before i can give it uh, you know into the market before i can launch a consumer product with it so that time to market can be longer right so what level of iterations you would need to do and your time translates into money because it's it's not just the time taken to run those experiments you know that industry partner will have to maybe hire a few people who are dedicated just for that effort if they have to buy new equip- equipment they'll have to understand the total cost which are required there may be certifications that they may have to go through if it's a legal thing they may need uh, legal permissions like if it's a medical technology product they may need some certification from the relevant councils so all those factors need to be understood for both from a time perspective and from a cost perspective you are in the business segment you know translate everything into cost ultimately and how do you know if that is going to be worth it or not you use financial models and once you use these models you know there are different ones such as uh, net present value meaning what you do is you you say that over 10 years of time these are the overall cost which you have to incur overall investment that you'll have to do but alongside that here is the revenue potential that you will also you know observe and so over a 10 years period of time uh, what is the net present value of doing that activity today and if that is going to be worth it you can say if that fine this is something that we can undertake and quite often what tends to happen is that in this phase once you start putting in the rupees and the time taken all together you may say that this approach may be too time intensive maybe maybe it can cost uh, a whole lot of uh, investment but the returns are not there for the taking the customer is not ready for this yet or the market size may be too small right so it's okay to come out of this project and say we will not explore this as a business but if your other two criteria are, uh, are okay which is the the people segment and the technical segment meaning if you are convinced from a literature search perspective if you are convinced from your technical solution perspective it could still be an impactful research project it may not be commercialized and that's okay okay so that's that's one important thing to keep in mind however if you met this challenge as well then you can be very confident that there is something that you can explore as a tech transfer opportunity so this is where if if this thing worked i would work with uh, let's say a tech transfer you know organization or or maybe i would work with uh, with different firms that can help me commercialize this okay so to recap what are these three design challenges so in the people segment we try to understand if the opportunity was real we did this using firstly industry reports through market surveys 
we try to understand the customer base here. And here our analogy for the customer is the scientific community. Right? Are they really looking for this unanswered question? Because you are noting down any opportunities for you to further investigate from a research perspective. Is it just you who's interested in it? Or are there other researchers, maybe other industry professionals who are interested in that need? So you're you're validating whether there's a real unmet need. At the end of the people segment, you basically identified a few problems worth solving. In the technical segment, you're trying to understand the impact of those problems if you solve them. If you solve it, compared to what exists today, compared to other competing approaches or other competing products, what is the performance of your approach? Is it 10x more? Or do you improve on the process side? Do you improve on the product side? You also want to answer if you have the necessary skill set. If you, your team, your company, or your research group may need training, you have to enable for those things. And if you may need, uh, you know, it helps to identify, will you need other equipment, other facilities to help you deliver it? The third challenge that we're going to address is the business segment. Basically, financially, is it going to be worth it? Considering the, the cost required to enable this, considering the time investment, is it going to be worth it you know, for you to address this opportunity? If you meet these three challenges, you would be very confident of, <clears throat> excuse me, of a research project that can be commercialized. But if you have answered successfully on the people and on the technical segment, but on the business segment, you may determine that the market is not ready for this right now. It is still an impactful research project, in my opinion. And Preeti asked an important question that is it advisable or do you need to sign an NDA before you reveal that with an industry colleague or expert? Uh, so Preeti, my suggestion is uh, yes, it, it always helps to do it. However, it may not be realistic always to have an NDA because your industry colleague would be listening to many ideas. And you know, you may you may choose to again explore this discussion in different levels. So if you explore it at a very high level where you're not divulging the, the core details, but if you're just asking their opinion about, about the importance of a problem or 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 you know whether that particular area is worth exploring, you may not need an NDA. But yes, when you're trying to, uh, or if you get into a situation where you may have to discuss the nitty gritties of how you, how you enable that, I think at that point, it's not just a cursory discussion. It is a very serious discussion. So at that point, I would say, yes, do strongly consider an NDA before you divulge more details. Usually these, these are done, like even let's say for a tech transfer sort of a discussion, it's at a very serious stage where you have something to offer and the other side has something to absorb. So this will naturally come. It's a good practice to do it. So uh, thank you for asking that question. And uh, your related question is, uh, as an academician, you may have limited resources versus the industry. And so should you file a provisional patent and then discuss the concept? Yes, that's a that's a good practice. Uh, you know, the provisional patent, however, is just a, a protection mechanism, right? So do keep in mind the timelines that if I'm filing a provisional patent application today, within a year's time, I have to complete the full filing. And if I don't do it, then uh, then you know, I basically don't have anything to enforce my rights on. So before you you divulge anything at a public forum, it's a good practice, particularly for for our research community, for our startups, because you will be going to different scientific conferences. You may be going to, to different pitch competitions. At all these places, you have to consider that these are public events. So if you're going to be divulging anything which is of importance to you, it will be counted as a public disclosure. So imagine if you presented 
that that exact process you know which helps you know 10x you know the performance of your product if you divulge that thing today and tomorrow you file that as a patent application the patent examiners could pull up your presentation today just one day before and say this is public knowledge so your own presentation can work against you so that is one aspect and the other is uh, is also you know you're protecting uh, any unintentional infringement as well from others so i yeah, do consider you know filing of provisional applications uh, highly highly recommended dr swati joshi asks uh, if there is any source to get industrial problems on one platform so that they can motivate researchers to pick anyone from them and start working yeah dr joshi there are uh, numerous initiatives which are there uh, some by the government and some by the industry so for example if you go to the uh, agni website a g n i i that is uh, an initiative of the principal scientific advisor you can see some of these uh, opportunities which are there for commercialization uh, you can also see sometimes uh, you know there are there are sites there are industry bodies which are discussing these things however a, a lot of these are are not uh, uh, put necessarily in a single domain right so you may see for example open challenges you may see hackathons which are there around a certain topic so that gives you an indication and a glimpse some of these challenges are found on portals such as the startup india portal where an industry is issuing out a challenge which is open for the public to solve so that's that's one way of doing it the other approach that i have seen is to have as an academic i would say have try to have good relations with the industry professionals in uh, at least in your uh, surrounding area so some of the good uh, institutes that do tech transfer what they have enabled is an open access to their professors so quite often the industry representatives will come to the to the institute and they will say we are facing this problem and why it is not explained in, in an open state firstly is because of conf confidentiality reasons also but sometimes also they want an you know you can't convey something like this in like say one paragraph on a website so they may want to have like a half an hour presentation with the professor and and the research group and explain the importance of what they are trying to do so if you have those those sort of relations with the industry in your surrounding regions you will develop this natural funnel of of good problems to solve uh, for the industry that ultimately benefits the consumers uh, professor kudalkar asked a product exists in market with a different feature but is not useful and the innovation applied is going to increase usage and value will it be a patentable innovation so the three criteria for for patents are are firstly uh, it must be novel compared to what exists before so if your method is new i would say that is going to be a primary criteria compared to what exists today the second one is uh, it should not be obvious meaning the the development of that method how to enable that should not be obvious and that's a third that's a separate criteria in itself and the third one which i think what you're alluding to is called as the utility criteria so the patent officers and examiners they determine if that invention is going to be useful to the public and now because the previous method would would fail you know considering what you've said your new method is going to make it more useful so so if you met the Uh, the prior art criteria meaning it is novel if you met the obviousness criteria and if you met the utility criteria then it will be a patentable invention you yeah, feel free to connect with me on linkedin also after this uh, you know may maybe uh, the turnip team can post that i believe they may have done it so i'll be very happy to answer questions outside of this as well uh, there's one question from sushant singh is it good to file the provisional patent early or wait for the prototype to be developed first so uh, sushant with a provisional patent you are in some sense buying time right so if your method is pretty solid so assuming it's a, it's a method for a method type of uh, of an invention you're talking about 
uh, before you've implemented, you could consider the provisional patent application because that gives you one year's time. And within a year's time, if you are able to converge on that, you can file a full application. Now, if your method changes significantly from what you disclosed in the provisional application, you could explore filing of a, of a new patent application. Okay, but the rights will be valid from that uh, new date. So, so I would say uh, if, you are, if your prototype development is going to take a lot of time and it's going to be deviating significantly from your path, Maybe wait, it's, I, I can't give you a clear answer because it's a very specific situation you'll encounter. Generally speaking, what I've seen is, is uh, if, your, if your method development is more or less done, even at the block diagram level, you could consider filing the provisional patent because you, know, you have a greater degree of confidence. Uh, it's a risk you're taking, but it probably could be worth it.